How many of you have been here on Friday or Saturday for revival? God has been doing some great things, and we rejoice. There's been a word going out that uh, I said in the early service, you know, as a pastor, many times we know what's going on in, in your lives as, uh, as we follow along, take care. But uh, an evangelist comes in, he has no idea uh, any, about the people necessarily, only what the Lord shows him and tells him and gives him to say. And some of the words that were spoken in the last couple days uh, were just amazing because it was just like uh, healing water, washing over lives and changing lives. And we rejoice in that. So listen, without any further ado, we want to give him plenty of time. Would you welcome our evangelist, Brother Dan Moeller? Good morning, everybody. Y'all doing good? Man, I like that. That was a jumpy little song. The whole way home I'm driving, I'll be like, he's real. <laughs> That's going to hit me the whole way home. That's one of them little lines you're going to keep singing. I like songs like that. They get in you and you remember them. You know, when I got saved, the night I got saved, I, I grew up in church. Uh, a lot of people think because they went to church growing up, they're saved, but there was nothing changed about my life. There was nothing Christ-like about me whatsoever. By the time I was 18... I didn't have any revelation of the gospel, even though I went to church. It's like all I thought was God sent his son so I could be forgiven. So when I die, I could go to heaven and I'm supposed to try to be as good as I can and make sure I stay in church. And uh, nobody ever taught me that I could be changed. Nobody ever taught me that I could think different, believe different and be different, really be different. And the night I got saved, I was 33 years old. I hadn't been in church for a long, long time. I was 13 years married. I was the father of two children and. I wasn't doing well. I was very self-centered. I, I didn't know how to love. I just needed and wanted it. I was never satisfied. I was very unthankful. I just imagine very hard to live with. And uh, on the night I got saved, what's up? Jump up and do it. Just lift your voice. You're the pastor. You can do that, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, kiddos, we were going to keep you in free chat you today. We were like, yeah, <laughs> love you, children, man. So I was at work, and, and I didn't care my marriage was ending. I, I was actually celebrating that. I had a lot of arrogant thoughts, and I was like, well, I married down anyway. I wasted my time with her. I can do better. Somebody's going to need me. I just had a lot of stuff going on, and uh so I was, I was a pretty lost man, and so it wasn't like I was hurting and thinking, oh God, you got to save my marriage, you know what I mean? Like some people do that, and I wasn't doing that at all. I wasn't even thinking about the Lord. But I was at work at night, and this is what I heard in my thoughts. I was working, and I heard, you don't even know if God is really real. And I tried to run from it. I tried to act like I didn't hear it, and I thought, what do I care anyway? Why am I thinking about God? It came right back. You don't even know if God's really real. After it's all over, and I'm 29 years in now, and I've been living Jesus for a while, and I've had the time of my life. <laughs> now I understand. Like, like it's amazing he didn't say, I uh, can't remember the last time you've been in church. He didn't say, I don't know the last time I heard you pray. I don't even remember you reading your Bible last. He didn't say none of that. He said, you don't even know if God is real. That gets me, man. He wants me to know him, not know about him, not stand here and preach him. He wants me to know him. And he paid a price for me to be one with him and have a relationship with him. And I think it's fascinating that I was so lost and I'm on this dark road and I was going to make some big mistakes. I was about ready to make some major mistakes. I was going to occupy my life. My marriage was over. You all know what I mean? I was going to occupy my life. I bumped into a young girl that I didn't see for years that when she was 12 and I was 20, which is weird, not to mention illegal. She had a crush on me. I, she, I, for some reason, she was just that little 12-year-old heart that was like, he's amazing. And, and she felt that way as a 12-year-old. And it was kind of cute but sad. When I was getting married on my wedding day, she was at my wedding, and she was standing there crying, and she was crying because it wasn't her getting married to me. And she was 12, but she felt that way, and she's crying because I was getting married. <laughs> well, I bumped into her, when my marriage is over and I'm not with my wife for a while and 
I'm 33 and she's 25. Well, nobody thinks about that. That doesn't, that's not a problem at all. 12 and 20 is bad. 25 and 33, nobody blinks. For some strange reason, she still had that look in her eye. And who knows, that's going to snare a man that ain't thinking Jesus. So I got that on my mind. And I think it was that night I went to work. God spoke those words to me and rescued me from making some sad mistakes. Because honestly, can I be raw with you? I didn't have the capacity to love that girl. First of all, if you're not living for Jesus, you ain't loving anyway. You're just needing and wanting and your feelings, you call them love. Because God is love. When I was a pastor, I wouldn't even marry people if they weren't saved because I said you'll never be able to love each other. You'll want each other. You could be kind to each other. You might even pull it off and have a decent relationship, but you can't love like God loves without God in your spirit. I wouldn't even do a wedding, man, unless they were born again, and that was a little paradox because how do you get them born again in conditions to get married? It's like, well, you got to get saved. Okay, what do I do? Say this prayer. No, you give your life to him. You don't pray a prayer to get saved. You give your life to him. You die to everything you've ever been so you can live to everything that he is. You don't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I know we teach that, but it's not correct. You die to yourself so you can live to who he is. You give up the old and you put on the new. You put off the flesh and you put on Christ. That's called born again. We're not praying a prayer so we qualify. We're becoming something because he paid for it. Are you all okay? You all with me? I think we've lulled ourselves to sleep with a prayer to go to heaven. I'm really concerned about it. I talk about it a lot. I'm glad we're all going to heaven. I'm glad there's eternal life. I'm excited. I'm never going to die. It makes me not fear. So you got to understand, I'm intense. I'm being cool and calm for you this morning because it's Sunday morning and I'm just being gentle. But I'm a madman. Like, I'm excited. Like, I was down in Alabama, and I preached to pastors, and they didn't want me there. There was people that said I was a heretic, and they didn't agree with what I'm preaching. And people get riled up over God, and then they'll act like He never will. And they'll justify it because they'll say they're right, but everything they're doing is wrong because they're doing what God never will anyway. I preached to 30-some pastors, Pastor Tim, or 372 pastors I preached to. I did my last session. These men are lined up, crying. We're praying. They're crying. And I, I brought it, man. I, I talked to them what I believed the gospel was. And if we're leaders, let's make sure we're leading people in the truth. Make sure we're not pacifying anybody and just trying to build a better service. Just doing church so people want to come instead of forming Christ in them so they can live him every day. Because we don't go to church. We are her. And I preached this like, ah, and these men were ripped because a lot of them just had theology background. A lot of them were just doing church. And they were cut to the heart. And they're crying and we're praying and God's moving. And it was fun. And I'm all done. I'm done, man. I went and sat down. I'm done. But I'm never done. But I'm done. <laughs> I sit down. And these men surrounded me. And it looked strange. And they were plain closed. And I thought, this looks weird. And the guy sitting right beside me leaned over and said, hey, Dan, I'm officer so-and-so. I said, yeah, that's what I thought. I said, and them guys? He said, they're all with me. I said, what's up? He said, well, we're concerned for your well-being. And there's some threats and some concern of threats, and it's concerning your life. I said, are you serious? Like threats concerning, well, yeah, there's some people that are really, really upset about the things you say. They don't agree with you theologically. They feel like you're bringing harm to this town. And they said, if you bring him in, he won't leave alive. And we're making sure you do. And I laughed and said, listen, bud, I appreciate you and respect you. I said, I can find you in the book of Romans. But I said, right now is not the time and place for you. I said, this isn't a violation, a traffic violation. This is spiritual. This is intimidation. This is threats. And if you don't walk through it, you'll have to face it the rest of your life. I said, here's what we're going to do. If they say they're going to kill me, let's let it play out and let's see if they can. And I can't even tell you how okay I was. And that's victory. You know, you say you're not afraid to die. But when a police officer sits beside you and tells you there's death threats and they're here to get you out safe and you ain't even blinking, you ain't even phased, you have the same joy in your heart and you feel the same as before you heard him say that, that's freedom. That's victory. And I said to him, I said, let's just let it play out. Let's just see if they can. 
Because I said, I don't think they can. I have way too much to accomplish and there's too much burning in my heart. I'm a wholly committed and a wholly surrendered guy. I don't think they're just going to take me out that way. I said, I don't want any protection. Nobody's shadowing me. You're not taking me to where I'm staying. You're not following me to the airport. I need you to forget about this and disband this. He said, sir, I strongly disagree with your approach. I said, I'm not asking for your agreement. I'm asking you to please don't shadow me. He said, you know, I thought we were going to have this conversation. I said, why did you think you were going to? He said, because I stood in the back and listened to you preach. I said, well, now you know I actually live what I preach. And I actually believe it with all my heart. Jesus is Lord and I'm just not afraid. I hung out. I stayed there long. I was one of the last ones to leave the parking lot. And I wasn't looking over my shoulder. And you can see I made it. You know where that confidence comes from? You know where that aggression comes from? You know where that comes from? He's not a theology to me. He's real. He's my father and he's in me. And this thing's for keeps. We already won. I'm I'm eternal. I'm going to live with him. Nobody snatched me out of the palm of his hand. He's eternal. I'm living forever. Case closed. I ain't never going to die. If there's a day that comes and you heard Dan Muller died, you ought to just shout because I ain't dead. And don't you say, oh my gosh, he died. No, he didn't. And if you show up where I am, you better push me aside because I'm going to be on his lap and you're going to need to make room. (laughs) Just something. (laughs) Sorry, I'm I'm messing up in your church today, man. There's just something about believing the gospel. It's not ever meant to be your theology. You're not serving a doctrine. You're not serving principles. You're getting to know the great and amazing and living God. He has made himself available and personal. And he's come to live right on inside of you. Like he's as close as the mention of his name. Like that's amazing. And what God did to me that night. He said you don't even know if he's real. Now here's the paradox. My life was a mess. I was so self-centered it was awful. I was hurting my wife terribly. I was about ready to live in fornication and adultery, and didn't even care. And yet on that day, before I heard that voice, I would have told you I was a Christian because of my church upbringing. How's that for conviction? My background would have said I'm a Christian. VBS would have said I'm a Christian. I could have told you he died on the cross for the remission of my sin. I guess that makes me a Christian. No, Christian means... Christian doesn't mean I believe in God. Christian doesn't mean I go to church. Christian means little Christ-like one. Ain't that something? I think we've sold some things cheap. I think we've invited everybody in for what they can get instead of what they can become. And if you don't die, you'll never live. And if you don't give, you'll never gain. You got to lay down everything you were born into called Adam so you can step into everything he paid for called Christ. This is not asking Jesus into your heart. This is Jesus becoming your life. And you putting off the old and putting on the new. Are you with me? Becoming a new creature. Created in Christ Jesus as if you never lived before. And that's what's wrong with me. That's what happened to me 29 years ago. And I'm more convinced now than I ever was in my life. Because he's real. Y'all sang that song. I thought, I'm going to be singing that the whole way home. (laughs) You're real. He's going to be like, okay, okay. I know I'm real. (laughs) Because I'm going to sing it. Because that's how I got saved. You don't even know if God's really real. He didn't come first person. He didn't come in a cloud, in majesty, in a thunder. He didn't make me feel him. He just let me think it was a thought in my mind. It came back again. You don't even, because I tried to blow it off, whatever. You don't even know if God's really real. And it froze me the second time. I started to think about it. I started to realize I had zero God reality. That I could have told you I believed in him. And I didn't even know if he existed. 
I could have told you he existed, but I didn't know him. And I can't even tell you how empty I felt inside, how lost I felt, how pitiful my life felt. And then God started kicking in with some sovereign, aggressive, coming after me stuff, where all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I got out of denial, and I looked at the gross selfishness that was in my life, seeing it for what it was. That's why I'm so aggressive against selfishness, because it does harm to everybody. It's like leaven in a lump. Selfishness is awful, because all it cares about is itself, and it doesn't even really like itself. It's driven by survival. Self is all about you. It's me, myself, and I. Well, you shouldn't have. Well, I wouldn't have if you didn't. Well, you started it. Well, how come? That's called selfish. That's you being moved by everything that's going on around you. You're always vulnerable. You think you're in control when you're selfish, but you're at the mercy of everything that happens. A person that's selfish thinks they're driving the car. They think they're in control, but you're subject to everything that happens, and your emotions are dictated by your experiences and your environments, and you're just one people person away from a fallout. Because you're selfish. When you're not selfish, you're totally free and nothing affects you. <laughs> and they could tell you they're going to kill you and you're not moved because you ain't going to die anyway. Yay. It's called freedom. Now we sing we're free. But what we think we're singing is we're forgiven of our sins. And then we even wonder if we are and struggle with that with guilt, condemnation, and shame. Ain't that something? No, when you're free, you're free because you're free from yourself. And why is that so important? Because the Bible teaches why God's made man and God, God put man on the earth. The Bible teaches why man's here. It's in Genesis right in the beginning. He made man for his image. The only reason man is on the earth is to be found in the image of God. God made man with intention, with purpose. We're not happenstance. We're not an afterthought. We're not a good idea. God made man for a reason. And that reason got lost through sin and man's disobedience. Jesus came to take care of man's sin and disobedience on the cross to get us back to God's intention. And we made it all about us going to heaven. Instead of heaven coming back into me and me becoming one with the Father, coming out of darkness into the light so I can walk in it as he does. And now I'm a Christian. Are you with me? That's why you love one another. That's why you don't hate one another. That's why you forgive. You sang it. He forgives and he forgets. And he heals. That was the line, wasn't it? Forgives and forgets and heals. We sang that today. That's exactly what he does. He forgives, he forgets, and he heals. Wonder if you and I live that way. Ah! That's the whole point. To reproduce himself after his own kind. Each seed after his own kind. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground. It abides alone, but if it dies and falls to the ground, it'll spring up and bear much fruit. If you find your life, you lost it. But if you lose it for his sake, you found it. Jesus was a seed. He was planted by God. He fell to the ground, and he died, and he sprung up, and he's bearing much fruit. Each seed, first law in your Bible, each seed after its own kind. He raises from the dead. What's the seed produce? Christ. That's why the Bible says the Christ in you is the hope of the glory of God. It's Christ in you. It's all about Christ. The seed produced Christ in everyone that would believe. Now we got Christians, little Christ-like ones, all over the earth. Unfortunately, that isn't the way it turned out. A lot of our messages are compromised. A lot of our messages are skewed. A lot of our messages are designed to keep people encouraged and keep them engaged and keep them wanting to come to church. We're trying to get better children's programs so more families come so that we can entertain and keep them here instead of just teaching them why God sent His Son, who we are now that He came, and what we're called to live. 
Come on, it's the truth. And if we're not careful, make sure you don't fit in this. I'm just talking at large. I'm not talking to you. I'm just talking at large. You've got to make sure you're not spoiled, that you're not self-centered, that you didn't become religious. Because if those things are true, you're not even thinking about Christ in the moment. You're thinking about how you feel, how they shouldn't have said that, how you need What? I never preached my mic off before. It was turned off in my pocket. I got to calm down. Dan, calm down. I preached right out of my mic, buddy. That's a first. That's a first. Wow, I'm back on. Wow. We're batteried up now. Woo! Man, it's so good that I don't have that problem in my life. Jesus, you go out to energizers any day. Jesus just keeps going and going and going. That's how I feel. I've been called the energizer bunny in my life. They say, you're like the energizer bunny. I'm like, no, I'm way better than him. Because he has a limit. I don't feel like I have any. People say, do you even sleep? I go to bed. I go to bed by faith. I just lay down. I, I reminisce. I talk to the Lord. I lay down in bed. This is what it looks like. I'm like, Lord, I just thank you. And about five hours later, I go. The way it is. It's just how it is. <laughs> Ain't that awesome? Listen, I want to take you back. I want to get back on track on this thing. Now listen to this. God made man for his image. And God is love. When man ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was the tree he was never to eat or be involved with because every tree he could eat and he was to work the garden and tend it and keep it. But of that tree, don't ever eat or partake of. What was it? The knowledge of good and... What's that tell me? God never made me to know anything but him. He just made me to know him. Do you know why it says unless you become like a little child? It doesn't say a child. It says a little child. Do you know what it says unless you become a little child? He's not talking about childish. He's talking about innocence. Because there's a short time in your life that we lose innocence. We get self-conscious. You can see it happen in a toddler where they get self-conscious and realize they're there. A little tiny one can walk up here in front of you while I'm preaching and do something and pick a flower out of there and walk away and not even know everybody was watching. But it's not long into age where you couldn't get away with that without knowing you're doing it. Becoming like a little child is a restoration back to innocence. The Romans says it this way, be excellent in what is good, be innocent in what is evil. A lot of Christianity has to do with the restoration of innocence. Getting us back to the beginning of what we're here for and what we're created to be. That's why we're supposed to put off the old and put on the new. Oh, make no mistake about it. There's no prayer just to take you to heaven. There has to be a putting off of the old and the putting on of the new if you're going to walk out what he really paid for. If you just prayed to qualify and now you, now you pray for blessings and at least I'm going to heaven when I die, brother. Hey, at least I made it. That, you're missing the whole joy of what he paid for. Because if you're self-centered, you're in the prison of your own self. 
and everything's moving you, you're always worried about your circumstances, you're always knocking on wood, whatever that even means. And when it's about you, you're just never okay. You take insults, you take things personal, you're insecure at certain looks and glances, and you're just never okay. But when you're selfless, you're absolutely free. And I'm just being honest, in the 29 years, I've met very few people that could look me in the eyes and tell me they're absolutely free. But the goal is freedom. Here's Jesus' evangelistic message. If you're going to follow me, I need you to deny yourself, pick up your cross and taxi through life, and don't let the way life is happening and unfolding dictate you and decide you. Let me be the deciding factor in your life. Don't let sin against you give the right to produce sin in you. Don't ever repay evil with evil. Overcome evil with good. Listen, deny yourself so you can pick up your cross, taxi through life, and now you're following me. That's Jesus' evangelistic message. You know what we do? If you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. And we give them security. Assurance, we call it. No, it's called new life, transformation. We don't even hardly preach water baptism. I'm going to one right after this church service. I'm all heading over to Wheeling to enjoy a baptism of a girl that she's given her life to God. And I preach baptism with, with salvation. I never lead anybody to the Lord without talking to them about the beauty of baptism. Why? Because it's a sign of dying. The water is death, burial, and resurrection. You're dying to live. You die in the likeness of his death so you can raise in the newness of life. It's more than forgiveness. It's newness of life. We stop with forgiveness. He wants that to be the start for newness of life. That's why we baptize, man. We put you under the water. If you're a good pastor, Dean, like me, you will hold them under till every bubble stops. You'll make this thing happen and get the point across. I don't care how big they are. The anointing, they can't get up. I'll hold you under one. They're like, shouldn't they bring him up? After the last convulsion, if you wait 40 seconds, you got him. Now you better be in faith. Because you bring him up. (gasps) New life. (laughs) Now what I learned, Pastor Tim, if they don't go, (gasps) at least we know where they went. Do you do it like that? Come on, man. I'm having fun with you because there's a point there. I don't know how many of us actually died. I think a lot of us sincerely want to go to heaven. That's a no-brainer. But I want to make sure this morning that you all can be real and conscious in your conscience of believing you're pursuing dying so you can truly live. Because if you don't die, you'll keep showing up. You'll keep having arguments and unresolved conflicts and issues and you'll be stuck on being right and who's wrong and well, they shouldn't know. Well, that wasn't fair. And you'll let everything matter more than what matters most. And then your whole life becomes your story instead of his life becoming your story. Now it's just about what you're going through instead of what he went through. And Now it's about how you feel because of what you're going through. Now, the highest grace you receive is that somebody seems to take interest in your story, but it doesn't change you. It actually gives you permission to be where you are, and where you are is in Christ. If you think about it, that will never touch the world with anything good, would it? Guess what the Father's pleased with? That you bear much fruit and that your fruit remains. So what kind of fruit are we bearing? What kind of tree are we? Because a selfish tree doesn't produce love and patience and peace and joy and kindness and forgiveness and mercy. A selfish tree produces me, myself, and I. See, Adam was never made to know anything but God. When Eve got deceived and Adam ate the tree, it was a tragedy. Because the image got lost. Didn't God say the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die? Did God say that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible, Pastor? I think I remember that being in the Bible. When you eat the tree, the day you eat the tree is the day you what? Did he fall over dead? Hmm. Well, you know God ain't a liar. If God said you'd surely die, something had to die. If God said the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die, well, then why didn't he fall over dead? Because it wasn't a physical death. What died was the image. He said, you die. What? His identity was in the image. His identity, who he was, was in God. The day you eat the tree... You will surely die. Guess what he lost through sin? Who he was. 
Guess what we were all born into? Everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. Guess what you were born into? Not having a clue who you were. Trying to figure it out along the way. Needing to be needed. Wanting to be wanted. Hoping to fit in. Needing somebody to show you mattered. Looking for affection. Wanting someone to care. Because you had no idea who you were. You were born without an identity. But yet you have a purpose hidden in God called His image. So Jesus comes in darkness and dryness and, and like a root shot out of dry ground, Jesus shows up. Ta-da! It's amazing. And, he, and, he, and there's nothing that's made that wasn't made through Him. Right? And yet He came to His own and His own knew Him not. They were so far removed from who He was that when they looked at Him, they're like, what's that? Who's that? And what's He saying? They were trained by a lie. They were homeschooled in the wrong home. And everything that was wrong was right to them. And everything that was right was wrong to them. Come on, it's in your Bible, man. They didn't even know what he was saying. They're like, what's he talking about? Who does he think he is? What's he saying? Your father. Do you know they wanted to kill him for calling God his father? Read John 5. They already wanted to kill him because he healed on the wrong day. Oops. You know what them Pharisees said to him? There are six days which a man could heal. And they got their stuffiness going on. And the lady's been sick for how long? You, you multiply the years by the six days. They had a lot of time for healing. And ain't none of them helped her. He steps in. She was bowed over with infirmity. What was it? 18 years? 18. What, what, how would you even do the math? 18 times 52 times 6? Because you got 52 weeks, you got 6 days a week to heal, and you got 18 years worth of that. Did I do the math right? So you time 18 and 52 and then times 6. That's how many chances they had for healing. But she ain't healed. Ain't nobody helping her. Nobody can. Nobody knows God. But one man who knows God walks in, said he knows God, heals her, and they have a problem because it's the wrong day. And they want to kill him. Thinking they're doing right. Saying they know God. They don't know God. They're acting like God never will. They want to kill him. And then he said something. Well, my father's always working. He's been working till now and he's always working. And they went, who? He said, my father. Ah! This man healed on the Sabbath. And he just called God his father. Father. And guess what your Bible says? They wanted to kill him all the more. So that was a worse trespass, a worse violation. Imagine this. The Christian so-called, the religious community was so removed from the reality of God that when a man called God his father, it was more worthy of death than breaking the Sabbath. You better find this stuff and see it in your Bible. That's how lost men were doing church. These were the leaders. Do you know why John says they wanted to kill him all the more? Watch. Brace yourself. Because people are taught not to believe this stuff, but it's in the book. The reason they wanted to kill him all the more because he called God his father, therefore making himself equal with God. Now that's not making us God when he says our father. What did he say when they said teach us how to pray? When they said teach us how to pray, what did he say? When you pray, pray saying what? Wait a minute. You mean he's not just your father? He's our father too? You mean we can call God father? We can actually say he sired us and we came forth from him? Yep, that's what I'm saying. When he rose from the dead, he said, Mary, go tell the disciples, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Making us one. And just a good side thought when he rose from the dead. Did his disciples do anything right when he got crucified? Did they all say they'd die for him at the Last Supper? Didn't they all say they'd die for him? Did any of them dare come close? This one man ran out of his clothes, streaked through the trees naked. When you run out of your clothes, you ain't laying down your life, buddy. I ain't a rocket scientist, but you're trying to get away if you run out of your threads. And when he raised from the dead, you know what he didn't say? 
Go tell my low-life, backstabbing, two-faced, game-playing, hypocritical, weak-willed, wimpy, self-centered, say one thing, do another group of losers that I got a score to settle. You know what he said? Because I'm just telling you straight. Whew, this stuff tears me up. If what happened to Jesus at the crucifixion happens to a pastor, he ain't getting in the saddle no more. He's hurt, broken, can't trust nobody, gave his life, gave his vision, his time, his trust, and all people did was break his heart, take advantage of him, abuse him. He can't even ride no more. He's so damaged, he can't even get in the saddle. And if he does get in the saddle, you hear the damage coming out of his pulpit. You know I ain't that far from the truth. But you got Jesus, who's our example, who we're supposed to follow. And the things I do, you'll do if you believe, because I'm the firstborn among many brethren, and you're predestined to be conformed to my image. Need any, need any more scripture? Oh, it's there. Makes us one. He raises from the dead. You know what he says to Mary? He didn't even say, go tell my disciples. He got more personal. He said, go tell my brethren. See, his mercy and compassion is so beyond our judgment and criticism. He says, man, these guys were so far over their head. They still don't see and know. They're so afraid of death. They say they're surrendered, but they so aren't yet. But they're going to be in a minute. Because if I be lifted up, I'm drawing all men unto me. I'm going to give them the power of my Holy Spirit. They're going to hang out. And Father's going to empower them to be a witness. This thing's about to get good. Go tell my brethren. That's family. That's covenant. What he's saying is, I'm seeing them as if that never happened. Oh, we do well to learn from Jesus. We do better to follow him. We do a lot of talking about him. People are intrigued by talking about him. They feel spiritual doing Bible studies. But at what point does the word become flesh? At what point does it become the life you live and not the theology you embrace? At what point are we deeper than just arguing our belief systems? At what point do we really walk in love and show the world that we know him? I said it. Probably last night, 1 John 4, 7 says, if you love, it's because you know God. You're born of God and know God because God is love. It says, if you don't love, it's because you don't know him. Now, he didn't say you didn't see your need for a savior. He didn't say you don't go on a mission trip now and then. He didn't say you don't feed the poor. He didn't say you don't pastor. He didn't say you don't lead worship. He just made a simple comment. If you don't love, there's one reason, not one of two or three or four. There's one reason you don't know him like you could. So the bar barometer and measuring stick of knowing God is your love. Because the whole goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy 1.5, is love. So if we miss love, we miss the whole point of the cross. We made the whole point of the cross going to heaven when we die. The whole point of the cross is you becoming love while you live. You can have all knowledge of all mysteries, all faith to move every mountain that ever stands in front of you. And if you don't have love, you have nothing because you missed the whole point. You can give your whole body to be burned and all your goods to the poor. And if you don't have love, you got nothing because you missed the whole point. Because the greatest of these is love and it never fails. That's why people are disheartened. That's why they're hurt. That's why they're angry. That's why they have unresolved conflicts. That's why there's tensions in marriages. Because we're still self-centered and won't admit it. Nobody will get humble and admit it. It just takes one to begin to pursue peace. We say, well, we're going to split up because we're not compatible. No, you're still self-centered and you haven't pursued love. And I'm being real. What do you mean we're not compatible? wonder if God just chose you weren't compatible to him. See, that's what we don't think about. wonder if God embraced our theology. wonder if the men had the power to change Jesus' mind. Ain't no man ever changed who he was. That's why he's changing men. He stood the test of time when he was on the earth. And men did everything they could. And it was the most injustice ever done to a human being. There was no one ever more innocent that should have never been treated the way he was treated. And yet he was treated that way. And he uttered not a word. Why? Because he wanted to pay the price to get all that guilt off of us. So we could stand in his shoes and live what he's living. And we made it about going to heaven when we die. God have mercy on us. No, it's so we can have integrity and we can walk in honor and diligence and stop hating one another and disagreeing with, with anger. Why, why can't we disagree without animosity? Because of the deep need to be right. 
We can't even disagree without tension. That exposes self-centeredness. If you can disagree without tension, that's a good thing. Most marriages have silent stuff going on, body language. They express their displeasure with a look, with silence. And then the spouse says, well, what's wrong? Nothing. Well, what, I didn't say nothing. No, I know you didn't say nothing. That's why something's got to be wrong. Like what? You, nothing. And then you go to work and walk out the door and leave it hanging right there. And prove you go to church, but you don't know Jesus. And you see your need for a Savior, and you've cried that out, but you haven't yielded to Him. And somehow you have the capacity to live the way He would never live, but proclaim Him. Come on, I know that's tight for some folks, but it needs to be sharp. Because when do we get humble? When do we admit this stuff? And when do we go, wait a minute, Jesus would never do that to my spouse. Then where do I find the right, no matter what details surround the situation? Where do I find the right to be what he never is? Oh, is this too strong? Are you okay? Man, it just feels this way in my heart. I'm sorry, guys. It's just coming, man. And I don't, I'm not mad at nobody. Can you tell I'm not mad? I'm having the time. I'm way too free to get mad. I'm having the time. You can hate me. You can disagree with me. You can not receive a thing I'm saying. But I know him now. You're way too late to reach me. Like, I'm going to have the time of my life for the rest of my life. I'm going to love people. I'm going to touch people. I'm going to have fun. And you can hate me. I don't want you to. I'm not trying to make you. But you can, but it don't change nothing. You can disagree with me. You can write anything you want, but you can't take him from me. You can't keep me from hearing his voice. You can't keep his presence from my life. I'm going to drive home today. He's going to be with me, and you can't do nothing about it. And when I pull in for gas, I got something to give, buddy. I ain't just worried about the pumps and the prices and wondering when Trump's going to get on a ball and get this thing even lower. Nope, I got something to give. Hey, how you doing? Man, what's going on? Are you having a problem in your hip? Why would you ask me about my hip? I ain't even walking. You don't even see me walking. No, it's just an impression. What do you mean an impression? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a man of God and I ain't playing. I'm a Christian. He lives in me. And he showed me you're having a trouble in that hip right there. That's true, isn't it? Look me in the eyes and tell me if that ain't true. He said, no, it's true. You're freaking me out. I said, oh, no. And then you, then you stop the pump and you walk over and you say, it gets way better than that, sir. And then you take his hand and you put your hand right on the sip and you pray. Do you know how many times I've seen that? Do you know why? I don't have issues. I see people around me. I don't have issues. I don't have unresolved conflicts. I ain't waiting on you. I ain't waiting on my wife to change. He's in my life. For a reason, we ought to walk it out. Phew. You know how many times I've seen that? <sighs> you know, I ain't afraid to approach him. I have no fear of man. I don't have no self-consciousness. I ain't worried about what he's going to think because I already know who I am. So what he thinks is going to be wrong if it ain't what I think. Because <laughs> I already know who I am. So you can't lie about me and make it work. That's why I said you can write anything. You would call me the heretic of all heretics because you disagree with me theology, my theo theologically. And you can write the most nastiest, degrading thing you could ever write about me, and you still can't keep me from hearing about that man's hip. And when I stand before God, I'm going to have that on my account, and I'm taking that fruit to heaven. You're going to have an article that you wrote in presumption because you didn't understand because men will mock and scoff what they don't understand. So all you'll have to show for your life is you witch hunted, and you probably didn't even find witches. You just thought you did. And the witches you're writing about are seeing fruit. Woo. How's that for confidence? Are you with me? See, that's the thing about knowing him. It doesn't make you arrogant. It just makes you confidence. And there's a difference. Confidence and arrogance aren't the same. The Bible says don't throw away your confidence. It has great reward. It's Hebrews 10. It's 35. It's there. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance. Why would you have need of endurance? Because not everything goes the way you're hoping. There's challenges. People act crazy sometimes. Sometimes your spouse does something unthinkable. Sometimes your children go off the deep end and you can't explain it and don't know why. And you're tempted to think you did something wrong. And it gets crazy for a second. No, no, you have need of endurance. You got to taxi through what we call life. You got to walk through and not change what you believe. The Bible says you have need of endurance so that after the will of God is fulfilled, you can receive the reward. What he's saying is you'll never fulfill the will of God without endurance. Why? Because there's pressure on the kingdom. 
and violent or taken their sake by force. Yeah? Our war is not people. Well, I know we wrestle against the enemy. I know there's a wrestling, Ephesians 6, against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. I get that. But even your fight's not even with the devil. Your fight is the good fight of faith. Your fight is never changing what you set out believing and never letting anything have the power to change what you believe. Your fight is the good fight of faith. Your fight isn't the situation. Your fight's not Nebuchadnezzar. Your fight's not the Philistines. Your fight isn't Goliath. Your fight is believing and never letting that thing in front of you change what you believe. You're fighting the good fight. Why is it a good fight? Because you win it. Where, where's Bobby? I talked to Bobby in the beginning. Where are you, Bobby? You talk, there you are. No, just, that's Bobby. Bobby was telling me about, it really spoke to him the other night because he tends to hold grudges. He was being really humble and really honest. And he said, my wife said, that's for you. <laughs> and it was funny. But he's telling me about a fight and that they were fighters and they settled things fighting when he was a kid. And he's 83, he told me. Watch this, watch this. A good fight. What's a good fight, Bobby? If you're in a fight and you got a black eye and your lips all busted, but he got two black eyes and he can hardly talk in a tooth missing. Was it a good fight? Uh-huh, see? He's gone. See, the good fight means you win. It doesn't mean you didn't get a hit in the chops. It doesn't mean you didn't go through something. It didn't mean you didn't have to taxi through some stuff that was challenging. It's a good fight because you win. I grew up in the city, people. I'm a nice and humble guy. I'm not a fighter anymore. Well, I am more than you know, but not that way. But I grew up, I grew up in the city. It's, it can be different than the country. Uh, you old country boys are tough, I know it. But, but the city is different because it's pecking order and you live all around each other and there's groups and groups of kids. Right? So there's that thing, that thing, there's that alpha dog, there's that submission, it's almost like a pack. And you end up, you got to fight. And everybody seemed to have a big brother whether they did or not. I'm going to get my brother on you. You don't even have no big brother. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And you're lying, hoping they believe you have a big brother. But now I got a big brother. But I just remember this. If I went home from fighting, and my jaw was so sore, my eye was puffed up, if I knew they looked worse, I was pumped. I was like, who cares what it feels like? I won that thing. They look way worse than me. I come home, my mom said, what happened? You man, your eye looks terrible. Oh, you should see him. You should see him. And I'm like, ur, 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 ur. you know, you're strutting around like a banny rooster. And you didn't accomplish nothing. The world ain't changed. You're just building your own ego. You're just digging the lie deeper. You know how somebody would come home from work? How was your day today? Can you imagine the Christian wife praying for her husband? Have an amazing day. God, let him have encounters. Da, 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 da. He comes home from work and says, how was your day, honey? She's believing. He ain't all that much into God. And he's in a gruff voice. says, I had an amazing day. It was amazing. She said, oh, my gosh, God, you must have moved. He said, I sure gave that boss a piece of my mind. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how you can tell somebody off and actually feel good about it? Like, feel like you're somebody. How deceptive and shallow and pitiful is that? Like, what did you do? You gave them a piece of your mind. Okay, now the world's a greater place to live. But that's how self-centered we are and don't realize how gross it is. And so shallow and weak and miserable. And when we stand before God, we're going to be, if we don't fix that, we're going to stand in the light of who he is and go, oh. I mean, it's going to be scary bad. Like in the sense of, oh my. And I'm, you know, he's merciful and he says he'll dry every tear. And some people are just banking on his mercy. And maybe, hey, at least if, as long as I get saved. That's a bad attitude. No, how about just live in Christ? How about having boldness and confidence on the day he shows up? Because you've been following him and living like he lives. Are you all okay? Are you all with me? i got to wrap this thing up. I'm way late. I was going to read so much scripture to you. I don't know where time went. It's Sunday morning. It's a short service. I am barely started. Do you all perceive that I'm barely started? No, no, you have no idea. That was not even hardly an intro for me. My heart is raging right now. We have gifts in the body. There's a five-fold anointing in the body. What's the purpose of it? To train and equip for the work of the ministry. That doesn't mean just handing out bulletins and ushering. Those things are important to keep this ship running. But the work of the ministry is the ministering of Christ. Watch. Till we come to the unity of the faith. Till we all believe the same thing. Now, that's not a theological thing. Watch. Everybody in this room 
Who here would say that Harbor Hope is my home church? Who would say that today? Let me see your hands. Okay, so every hand that's raised, listen, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you, though. Watch. So every hand that's raised, if we could accomplish this in this church, this would be amazing. That everybody that raised their hand and said they're a part of Harbor Hope Church would settle in their heart today that the reason they come here, the reason they come here is to be trained, equipped, and empowered to walk in the light as he's in the light so they can wake up and live Christ every day. I don't come here because I need to go to church or I'm supposed to go to church or I should go to church. Or I think God wants me in church. The reason we gather is so we stir one another in love and good work so we can form people in Christ. The biggest challenge of a local pastor is trying to come up with ways to do better church because there's church shoppers. And they want to comply with what they're looking for and provide the product that will sell them. That's a zero. We're not trying to do better church. We're trying to become more like him. Now, it's great to do great church, but the goal is forming people in Christ. Watch. If this pastor and his wife, all they do is provide an atmosphere that people enjoy coming, but they're not forming them in Christ, then we've accomplished nothing. We're just buying time that we don't have to give. And if I go to work and don't know how to love, then why am I here doing what I'm doing? Because I'm missing the point because it's all about love. So the unity of the faith is this. It's everybody that raised their hand believing this, that they were made for God's image and that the reason God sent his son is to get the image back into my life because it was lost through sin, but Jesus took away my sin to get me back to the Father. Are you with me? So watch. So the reason I wake up in the morning Is not to survive, not to make it, not to weigh my plate and pray into my day. God, if if you don't show up, I'll never make it past noon. I got a tough. The whole reason you wake up in the morning is to shine. You, You wake up to be like him. You wake up to love. Now, if we can get the unity of faith and the people that raise their hand to actually believe that that's the number one reason they're a Christian is to wake up in the morning and no one owes them a thing because they're on the earth to shine, that'll change everything. That will do miracles for marriages. If we actually sincerely, genuinely become that in our heart and pray that into our life and start living that, oh my goodness, it changes everything. Your counseling will just go and disappear. No, because we'll cover each other with love. And we won't be nitpicky and fault-finding. Well, he said, well, she said, well, I wouldn't. We wouldn't even be here, Pastor. She would be, well, you know, I'm, ah! The unity of the faith. That we all grow into the unity of the faith, watch, and grow up into him, the full measure of the stature of Christ. Yeah? To grow up in him in all things, to the full measure of the statue of Christ. Does that sound limited? Or does that sound wide open? So I'm late. So I'm finishing. I'm done. But please hear my heart cry this morning in the Holy Ghost. He paid for a lot more than you to be protected, provided for, and go to heaven when you die. In fact, sometimes it don't feel like you're protected. Sometimes it don't seem like you're being provided for. And that's why you need endurance. So you don't let that Take away your vision and purpose and focus. Because you'll never fulfill his will without enduring. That means there's challenges. Run the race with setting your eyes and looking unto who? What'd he do? He started this thing and started your faith. And who finishes it? So what do we do? Keep our eyes on him. Are you all with me? Is that fair enough? Listen. If you aren't submitted to Jesus, if you've never been saved, tell, t- t- let's just stand up, Mark. Stand up, Tim. If you've never been saved, come up to one of these gentlemen after the service. And, and, and there's no emotions. There's no music. You just come up and say, man, I heard what this man said. I've never committed my life to Jesus. Would you be okay if somebody walks up to you and says, can you give me Jesus? Can you pray for me and make sure I know I know him? You be good with that? So you don't even have to stay up here. You just do what you do. But find these men and come. There's somebody here. I wouldn't be doing this. You're here. I don't know how you got here, but you're not born again. And you, you heard this message. You said, well, why don't you just have an order call, Dan? Nope. There's something about you stepping out of yourself and finding this man and say, I heard what that man said, and I haven't been living that at all. I haven't even known Jesus. I need to get saved. I want to get born again. And then that way you'll have a leader here because I'm leaving. They can talk to you about getting water baptized because you might be glad I ain't doing it. (laughs) 
<laughs> and they can find you some water, and they can put you under and bring you up in new life. Bam. And Jesus can forgive you of everything you've ever done. Did I mention I was at a teen ranch this morning to you guys or the early service? Early service, yeah. Okay. So get born again if you're not born again. I actually feel like there's three people. I feel like you'll be approached by three people in this service today that'll come in boldness and say, you know what? I'm serious. I heard what he said and I'm coming. You say, why don't you just have the article? I don't know. I just feel like I'm asking them to be available because they're leaders. I'm leading. I'm a guest speaker. Are you with me? Yeah. So God bless you, Pastor. I'm sorry I'm so late. Whoever's closing, please close because I'm in trouble probably. Let me go up here and get my Bible. How many of you could, how many of you could have took a whole lot more? Amen? Amen. Come on, get, put your hands together.